Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to Reporters, the very best of France 24 from around the world. In this edition, a leader branded a war criminal by the international community faces growing discontent from within his own borders. But Sudan's leader, Omar al-Bashir, will give no quarter in holding on to power. Protesters run the risk of deplorable treatment if arrested, especially if you're female. It was women students in Khartoum who started the calls for change that are now being echoed on almost every level of society in Sudan. But al-Bashir, the president they would like to see gone, is wanted by the International Criminal Court, a man whose ruthlessness has been witnessed in Sudan's internal trouble zones, such as Darfur, where Al-Bashir's forces are reported to have slaughtered some 300,000 people in a campaign of ethnic cleansing. The ongoing conflict with South Sudan over vast oil fields along the disputed bordered areas is also something preoccupying people's minds. France Maquette's Caroline Dumay has been to gauge the mood. She met people who put themselves at risk, even talking to her. This is her report. In Sudan, anger is rising fast. Since June, the country has seen sporadic but frequent protests. They call it the revolution of the impossible. Freedom, democracy, down with the dictator. They have as many slogans as they can chant, as many as they can write on their flags. Rudwan Dawood is one of the faces of this uprising. He has joined the ranks of the thousands of renowned unknowns who are courageously rising up against the dictatorial regime of President Omar al-Bashir. From behind the walls of his palace, the president is responding with repression. The Sudanese spring has to be nipped in the bud at all cost. Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, seems like a peaceful city. But far from the plush neighborhoods, on the other side of the Nile, the uprising is stirring. Rodwan's family lives in the suburb of Hayusif. They were delighted to see him again when, at the end of June, he interrupted his studies in the United States to join the revolt blowing in the wind. We met him just after he arrived back home. Our uh, fighting and our war is not only against al-Bashir in, in his person. He's not the only problem. He's just the result of our historical problems. I'm fighting against the discrimination. I'm fighting against the marginalization, the lack of freedom, the lack of democracy. So I feel like I don't want to go back to the U.S. before I see the change uh, happening. I know it is dangerous, it is risky, but we don't have any other option. Rudwan and his family are no strangers to discrimination. They come from Darfur, a region where massacres of the indigenous people earned President al-Bashir an international arrest warrant. Moreover, Rudwan represents everything the regime cannot abide. He's married to an American, and he works for an NGO in South Sudan, in those areas devastated by the war with Khartoum. On top of that, Rudwan belongs to Gurifna, a group of political activists whose name means fed up in Arabic. These protesters call themselves non-violent revolutionaries. The video clip they've sent out is full of humor. From the day he arrived, Rudwan started mobilizing other students. He organized a training seminar in his neighborhood on the use of non-violent protest methods. He's the only one who was prepared to speak on camera. The other protesters won't let us see their faces for fear of getting arrested again. Women who end up in al-Bashir's prisons are particularly vulnerable. In fact, Garifna became known last year when one of its members confided on YouTube that she was gang-raped in jail. Like Rudwan, some of the others live abroad but have come home to support the uprising. To better cope with the tear gas the law enforcement agencies are using in ever-growing quantities, Garifna's members are copying the tricks used by protesters in Egypt and Syria. Rudwan has shown them how putting alcohol on a paper mask helps you to move through the fumes more easily. Masks are handed out, and those in training are shown videos taken during recent protests. We capture this tear gas from the security guys. 
Sudanese police are using more and more tear gas to disperse the gatherings. The protesters have started fighting back. They pick up live grenades and hold them back at the security forces. Several have lost their fingers like this. Accidents are frequent. Increasingly these days, the protests fan out from the mosques after Friday prayers. In a few months, the student revolt has spread through all layers of Sudanese society, young and old, men and women, rich and poor. The uprising has come a long way since its first stirrings in this university dormitory for girls. But all Sudan's revolutions were started by students. That's why the authorities strike at them with an iron fist. So far, more than 2,000 people have been arrested. Mohamed Salah is among those who disappeared in one of the regime's many ghost prisons. If anything happens to our children, we, the families, we're going to take justice into our own hands. In Khartoum's inner suburbs, those who are released from prison are given a hero's welcome. This student only spent 72 hours in custody and was lucky enough to be released pending his trial. He risks a fine, a prison sentence and 40 lashes. For girls and boys alike, corporal punishment is a part of life in Sudan. All this, and even here, you can see, all this, not only him, but a lot of people. They made us lie on the ground. It was really hot, boiling. They made us lie like that with the shirts off on the ground for such a long time. There were a lot of us. The police chief came and told us never to protest again. He said he was going to tell us which saint to pray to, that we were clearly on the wrong path. The activists talk endlessly about the brutality of the security forces. Wow, he said 14. One of them is just 14 years old, and he might be released because he's too young. He may be released, but the four of them, they don't know. They may be uh, sent into the jail. If the revolt is spread, it is because political parties have joined the cause. In mid-July, about 20 opposition groups signed a pact calling for regime change. And so Rudwan and his group became part of a movement that now unites the entire political opposition. But faced with a president who's playing deaf, the political leaders of the uprising seem despondent at times. It is the habit of this regime. They will never respond positively to the crisis of people. They will never respond to the uh, hands of people that Tell them, please, stop this and come and sit to find a way out. They say we are on the right way, although they are not. They will never listen. They will never listen. After South Sudan seceded, the country lost three quarters of its oil revenue. The oil dollar tap has recently reopened, but the Sudanese pound is struggling and inflation is still soaring. The more pressure these economic difficulties put on the regime, the more the activists step up the pressure from their side. It is in this hall that the first protest against the rising cost of living was held. As Rudwan explained, the movement has changed over time. If it lacks the dramatic impact of the other Arab revolutions, it is because it also lacks the media coverage that added to the momentum of those. In Sudan, international journalists are expelled and social media is not widely used. Uh, Only the very educated youth, uh, they use the uh, social media. But the rest of the people, they don't know even about Facebook. They have no idea about Twitter. Unfortunately, we, we don't have uh, good media here to cover what we do. What we do is really a lot. And it is revolution. It is real revolution. The Secret Service started following Rudwan when he arrived back home. 
He was arrested along with his family and a dozen members of Garifna on the night of July the 3rd. He spoke to us by telephone from prison and described his first days in detention. Uh, I was like uh, being beaten all the night until the morning. Then they moved me to another station of the security. They were beating me until the morning again. And they were forcing me to admit and to say that, yes, I'm a spy, U.S. spy. Uh, like, uh, I, I belong to CIA. They were beating me everywhere. Rudwan was charged with terrorism and risked the death penalty. But all the state could produce as proof were a handful of flags and some old tires, the alleged means to start an insurrection. Rudwan was not in court on the first day of his trial. He was tortured so badly where there was no state to walk or speak. His family was also in a state of shock. His father, who was arrested on the same day and beaten, had been released. His sister says she will not lay down arms. <laughs> I'm not scared. We all die only once. We all stand with Rudwan because he speaks for all of us. He has four brothers. None of them have work. None of us can carry on like this. Rudwan's battle is the battle for Sudan. Rudwan was acquitted, but despite the court ruling, he was re-arrested on the very same day by the Secret Service, a law unto themselves. International pressure contributed to Rudwan's release, but he's been forced to leave Sudan. In his 47 days in jail, he endured all the regime inflicts on his enemies, from mock execution to beatings to threats of rape. France 24 caught up with him as he arrived back in Washington, free but in exile. Yeah. 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 Good to meet you. Good. Yeah, I'm still alive. It's <laughs> <laughs> the most important part of the show. It's really sad when they have made me sign a kind of an agreement, uh, like first, not to involve in any political or humanitarian activities. Second, to leave Sudan and not come back forever. I'm not afraid if they did arrest me again, and even if they, they killed me, but I, I cannot stop myself from going back to Sudan. Rudwan does not mention the effect torture had on him, but tells us that his brother, who was jailed, is still in a psychiatric hospital. He insists he will return to Sudan. More than a year after Arab nations overthrew their dictators, the Sudanese spring is still a long way away. Caroline Dumay joins us now by satellite from Cape Town. Caroline, tell us the latest on the people and the groups that you met in your report. Well, uh, Rudwan, to start with, Rudwan is obviously doing very well. He's back home now, and home is in the United States on the West Coast uh, in Oregon State. And he's just arrived. You know that his wife actually is quite happy pregnant. She's about to give birth to a little girl that they will name Sudan. So it's like a happy ending for them. I mean, they're all reunited. Uh, when it comes to the rest of the group, you know, most of them were arrested. Uh, a lot of them have been tortured and they were released as well. Uh, but a couple of them had to go into exile. So, I mean, you've got like happy stories and less happy stories. Is there anything, though, now like a united front of protest in Sudan? Well, not really, actually, you know. Uh, in June and July, there, there was like quite a big uprising. Uh, and then you had Ramadan and then quite a lot of international pressure, uh, which led uh, President Bashir to, to kind of release hundreds of political prisoners. Today, the opposition is starting again and trying, and, but there was a press conference uh, this week. And they were kind of saying they, they, they're not quite united. You know, some want soft change, some think that they should actually reorganize an uprising. Uh, they, they don't know, quite know what to do actually to change that very tough regime. But uh, the spokesman of the, the coalition of the opposition, the spokesman was saying that uh, to repression, they must actually answer by repression. So most of them know that it's actually going to be quite tough. 
Let's uh, focus on the uh, Sudan South Sudan issue now, Caroline. Negotiations are going on between the two in uh, Addis Ababa. Is there any sign of an agreement? Well, there's actually very little progress. You know, they, they, they kind of struck a deal last month, and it was mostly uh, uh, fees about the transit of the oil. Uh, but this deal is actually not operational because uh, North Sudan is asking uh, for guarantees on, on its borders. They want actually uh, to secure the borders first before any oil goes from north to south or south to north. So uh, it's actually not, not ready. Uh, the UN had given uh, some sort of deadline, 22nd of September. If by them they don't actually have a deal, well, then they risk sanctions. Carolyn Dumay in Cape Town, thank you very much uh, indeed. And if you'd like to see Caroline's report uh, again, you can, of course, via our website, francefancat.com, in French, in English, or in Arabic. This is Reporters. You're watching France Fancat. Stay with us.